so we heard from uh, Carl what's going on in Belgium and the work that he's doing with a very specific number and now opening it up for people to register. Uh, simultaneously to that, there's been other projects going on. Last year, those of you who were here heard Ann Madden speak about microbiology and the and, and the sort of the some of the the yeast and the wild yeast and the and bacteria that are found in unusual places. And and uh, Ann's colleague uh, Aaron McKinney has been working on similar projects as well. And when the when the call for proposals came in and hers came in and we're looking at it, and we're going, why wow, this would be a perfect thing to pair with Carl's, and so I think this is a really way to keep this conversation going because it's, it is, as you can tell, so fascinating. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to, um, well, Dr. E.A. Aaron McKinney to talk about, uh, well, citizen science. Just explain what citizen science means, how it leavens sourdough research. Aaron, thank you. Thanks so much. I'm going to just swap over to my slides. Um, and while I do so, thank you for having me. And certainly, thank you to Piratos, um, who have apparently been our longtime partners in research at this point uh, through Sourdough um, and our, our accomplices in studying this practice. Um, and also for sponsoring to all the sponsors. This has been amazing for me as an academic. So. Yesterday, I think uh, Jennifer said she felt a little out of place, and I thought, oh my gosh, you study grains. Um, because I, I study gut microbes <laughs> for most of my uh, academic career. Um, so I've been really busy thinking about nutrition uh, and diet and the way that we digest foods uh, across several species of animals um, that are not human. Uh, but that do live in zoos. So we ourselves like to live in captivity, right? We don't think about such glorious surrounds as being captive environments, but we self-select. So I've been thinking about questions about other animals, great and small, um, but still these tiny invisibilia that live in our lower guts. So it's been uh, with great pleasure. Uh, you can imagine food and guts uh, and fecal matter do not transfer readily to bringing your work home with you, or certainly uh, comfortable dinner conversations. So it has been really great in my new uh, role as a postdoc in Rob Dunn's lab um, to actually transition into things that I was doing as a hobby anyway. Um, so I ferment a lot of foods, uh, lacto-fermentation. I've gone from studying the microbes in our guts to the microbes associated with foods that we put into our guts. Um, so I've been lacto-fermenting pickles and pretty much any produce that you can put into a jar for um, three, four years now. Um, this started as, you know, thinking about, I mean, I'm eating for two at this point. Never have I been at a con uh, conference where it's so appropriate to say, I have a bun in the oven. Um, <laughs> so thank you for this opportunity. Um, <laughs> But, you know, I'm not just eating for two. I'm thinking I'm eating for 100 trillion, right? So, so my microbial work has really transformed my thoughts of food. Um, I've been really appreciative of the fine spreads that we've been given at this conference. Um, but then also starting in Rob's lab, I thought, how appropriate. I will start my own starters. So um, Carl, wherever you may be, I have, I have 12 in my fridge, um, so not quite the, yeah, I know, I know, but we'll get, we'll get to my science library in a moment, because <laughs> we might, we might, uh, <laughs> we'll arm wrestle for the trophy or something, right? <laughs> um, so I've gone from, you know, the things that live in your guts to the things that you put inside your guts, and really, what I love about this is that microbial cultures truly do underlie human cultures. So many thanks to Eric for setting up this beautiful history story. This is also the first conference or talk of any kind, outreach or otherwise, where I haven't had to set up the context and why we care about sourdough and how important it's been for our history. So thank you to everyone who spoke yesterday because, wow, this is kind of an easy talk. Now I can jump into like what I want to talk about. Um, so that's amazing to be on the same page as everyone. And thanks to everyone who has been so approachable as a hobbyist, ooh, sorry, as a hobbyist um, bread baker, uh, to be able to just talk to everyone who does this for a living and who is still willing to share, you know, 
just information and trade secrets. To walk into a room full of celebrities uh, has been really humbling, but it's been, it's been amazing. So with the gushing and fangirling aside, um, <laughs> let me uh, bring you into what I do. So we're really interested in you know, kind of what does make it bread, right? And in, in pairing this idea of sourdough research um, that in many ways parallels the efforts by Piratos with citizen science. So for those of you who are unfamiliar, citizen science is an effort to engage the general public. And the general public could be everyone who walks the streets of the city, right? It could be um, I'm specifically interested in engaging students at public schools, um, which include everyone from K through 12 all the way through undergrad. Um, and in many cases, I think of graduate students as, as the public too. Um, people who might not think of themselves as scientists yet. We all have critical thinking skills. This is my, you know, go team, right? You have these skills already. You already practice critical thinking every day, which are practical skills that scientists use every day. So you too are scientists. You more than most of the general public because baking and cooking, these are sciences. So well done you. You're already there, even if you didn't recognize it. Um, and one of my big missions is to you know, engage the public across generations and across kind of social strata and, and to empower. And I think that sourdough is a perfect platform for this. Because just as microbes transform flour and water into something delightful and nourishing that we can eat and enjoy and that sustains us, I think that citizen science has really transformed our scientific research through um, the study of something that is so universally loved and devoured um, and that's cr actually created and practiced by people who really work with these sourdough starters every day. So they're, they're highly invested. There are several many citizen science projects ongoing in uh, Rob Dunn's lab, looking at the microbes in shower heads, looking at the microbes in soils, um, and none of them have had the tremendous amount of investment and feedback from the participants that we've had from the Sourdough Project. It's incredible. There's a Facebook page, the Sourdough Project. You can join it. There are participants from our project who are in there posting pictures of their, their bakes every day. You know, participant number 604, newest loaf, tried something special today. And they're sharing openly the recipes. So this approachability. Um, this conversation that's going on is, is true to all of the participants and not just the bread people in this room. So it's really been incredible to tap into that. And those participants have also helped to shape our hypotheses, which is amazing as well. There are so many practices that have been ongoing and um, kind of anecdotally shared for years, decades, perhaps millennia, right? And to be able to now turn a more scientific eye to test you know, here's what we think is going on, what scientifically and microbially is actually going on. So this is, uh, for me, a story of alchemy, right, of transformation. So the big question for me has been, where are these microbes coming from, right? We know that with these mature sourdough starters, you've essentially grown a microbial zoo, right, um, that has, you know, several many types of bacteria and fungi, some of which are yeast. But where are those microbes coming from? So last year, Anne introduced this project um, with Pirato. So again, the big shout out. Um, this, this project in Belgium that was last summer that I'm so sad that I wasn't able to go to. But I was just a neophyte in the lab at the time. Um, and they undertook this massive experiment, to me, an incredible amount of control to have the same kitchens, the same resources, the same water source, the same flour, starters made by different people. So that kind of control is, is dreamt of you know, in scientific scenarios. To really find out, you know, what is this baker's signature? What are you giving to your starter? And a few teasers, right, it does seem that bakers themselves, each of you does impact your sourdough individually. It does seem, as Carl was saying, like being a female baker may impact starters separately from being a male baker. So there are some char uh, shared characteristics that we can trace back, right? 
But there are also some shared characteristics generally about bakers. Bakers in general tend to have a different skin microbiome. So not only are you affecting your sourdough, but your sourdough may be having a feedback and affecting what you carry with you every day. So that's really interesting. And I'll stop there because I want to leave the rest of the story for Anne and Rob to be able to tell. But those uh, results are still coming in. It's a really exciting story. So from the individuals, now I'll take you to a messy global data set. So the Sourdough Project, um, this is our, our Sourdough Collective. So there are 10 of us total. Um, you see we have Rob, Ann, Lauren, Lori, Leah, and I, so the six of us, um, are all Dunlab affiliates. And then we're working with, um, let's see, all of the starters that are collected are sent to Tufts University, where Ben Wolf is kind of our, our Gabetti equivalent for the culturing efforts, uh, Ben and Liz, culture all the microbes, and then isolate each of the different types of microbes from these starters. So, um, and then we have, sorry, uh, Noah Fearer then gets those samples and does all of the DNA sequencing. So we can find even those microbes that are present in the starters that don't grow well in a specific selective agar petri plate, if that makes sense. So we can see who's actively growing on specific selective media, and then who is present in anything, okay? So we have these starters from around the world. Um, we collected 563 starters, um, <laughs> though from 17 countries. So it's a trade-off, right? <laughs> but um, as I said, we can arm wrestle in a friendly way later. No. <laughs> So we have these starters from around the world, and we also got these amazing personal histories from every participant, not just on their feeding practices and whether they keep their starters on, in the count, on the counter or in the fridge in between feedings, but whether they have pets, and not just the pets they have now, but the pets they've had for their entire lives of having these starters, sometimes the past 30 years. We got documentation of oxalotl and <laughs> you know fish and cats and dogs, and just these tremendous histories. Um, so many different names for all of these different starters. I haven't looked for a sex effect if there tend to be more male names from female bakers and vice versa, but now I'm curious and following that up. Um, but just these amazing histories that could themselves be perhaps written into a book. Um, very, very interesting also to dive through that personal accounting for actual data we could analyze. Um, so, and many of these have traveled the world. So, what you don't see here, sorry, are um, I had migration lines mapped out. So, many of these starters have actually been given and traveled like several different countries across decades or even hundreds of years. Again, this is anecdotal. We don't yet have an, a way of actually testing, you know, carbon dating your sourdough isn't a thing we know how to do yet. Um, but also the travel patterns of these starters are incredible. So we have a, a sourdough migration map that you'll just have to imagine for a moment. <laughs> like so many glutinous threads across the planet. Um, so here is a, one of several gorgeous pictures of the uh, cultured yeasts that Liz Landis and Ben Wolf have grown from some of these starters. So you can see we have a tremendous morphological diversity of these microbes that can grow um, in these you know, selective media. So if you give yeast um, a specific type of agar that has yeast extract, it's a bit of a Soylent Green story, right? How do you grow better than on you know, your own dead? Right, a little, uh, little macabre. Um, but we get these gorgeous morphologies. Um, so there's a visual distinction between some of these yeast types. Others look very similar to each other. So from those yeast types, Liz would then have also isolated, let's see, have we got a, yeah. So we have one, whoop, wait for it, one, two, three, four different morphologies here, right? So Liz would then have four extra plates for this one sample of sourdough starter that she would isolate each of those four different colony morphologies to grow a pure strain, which then can be cultivated for sequencing to find out its entire genome instead of just a kind of fingerprint gene marker to find out who it is. 
So very in-depth sequencing. Um, but also we can do metabolic tests to find out what nutrients does each of these microbes enjoy eating most? Um, how is it best adapted? Um, what are its abilities? What aromatic and flavor compounds might these microbes be um, creating? So pretty incredibly uh, in-depth profiling here. Um, and then when we get the sequencing data back, um, then we can actually compare the yeast and bacteria, the most dominant types of each of these two you know, major microbial groups. And so just for um, comparison, let's see, on the left is a starter from Raleigh, where I'm based, and on the right is a starter that's kind of, um, you know, uh, I would say uh, joint custody between Raleigh and, and Durham. Right, so it's back and forth between cities. It's a mother and daughter. They kind of share this starter. But the Durham one was originally from Russia. So whether it's due to that, you know, the, our 37-year-old starter or um, our, like, five-year-old starter here that was started in Santa Barbara, right, you have these different uh, personal histories of each of these starters. You have very different uh, microbes that are dominant. Um, some are quite unexpected and they actually bake very different breads. Um, so what we actually did with these starters to connect um, what we're finding um, microbially to the foods that we eat is uh, we've come up with an incredible science campaign. Um, and this is a series of events that will explore the science and the ecology of foods in the dining halls at North Carolina State University's campus. So I got to go into the dining halls and work. This was my first experience um, in kind of a, a major production kitchen. Um, and it was, it was amazing, the welcome that we got. Everybody was so excited, like, here are these scientists, and one of them's helping us bake bread. So they gave me a hairnet and an apron and the whole deal. And they came over and said, like, what are you doing? <laughs> Why are we making all of these different loaves of bread? Um, and it was really to connect back with the public. So we did this wild bread event, was our first one. So if you're interested, you can keep up with all of the other incredible science events that we'll be doing across the next year or two. Um, so, and we have a gallery here also of the educational um, and outreach materials that we came up with. Um, this is with Lauren Nichols, um, the lab manager for Rob, um, and also Neil McCoy, who is just brilliant at graphic design. So we came up with all of these uh, conceptual design pieces that help to really communicate what we've found so far. So that's been tremendously exciting as well, to connect back with these students who eat bread and never think about microbes as a part of their food, right? Because food is sterile, right? I mean, so we've been breaking down those walls and, and kind of destroying those misconceptions that they might have, reconnecting them with their food. So one of those uh, kind of tremendous discoveries that we've made is compared to kind of, you know, three types, three basic strains of this um, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, right? I'm preaching to the choir right now. But our commercial yeasts, right? There are three major uh, types of yeast that would be used widely commercially. Compare that to 71 types of yeast that we detected in the sourdoughs that we've collected from these 563 part participants. And even that is just a drop in the bucket, because there are over 1,500 yeasts that have been described worldwide. So within this diversity of sourdoughs, the Saccharomyces cerevisiae is certainly the most dominant, but you can see those other 70 types are widespread, and they occur at different kind of densities in different sourdoughs. So it's been really exciting to see, to not only discover more yeasts that are associated with these sourdough starters, but to see from those uh, relative abundance uh, levels, we can then see if you have, um, as an ecologist, I think, if you have kind of equally occurring uh, you have kind of a balance of different yeasts. They might be more cooperative, right? Whereas if you have uh, a lot of one type and then just a very rare, uh, small amount of another type of microorganism, that to me speaks of co 
competition, right? Or just trace elements um, from another. It's the storming, uh, trying to siege the, the fortress, as Carl was saying, right? Or maybe these little guys showed up with a knife to the gun show, right? <laughs> Um, so we can actually kind of make some ecological, uh, intuitive kind of uh, estimates of what's going on in these communities dynamically that then we can use to test over time. Is this really happening? Well, for that, we'd have to go back to the lab. And those 71 types of yeast are just a drop in the bucket out of all of the different types of fungi that we found. So this is incredible, too. What are all those other fungi doing here? So in this graph, the yellow are the yeast. But you can see black and blue are the other dominant major players of fungal types. And we don't usually think of fungus as maybe something we want in our food, unless it's like sauteed mushrooms, right? Um, so this is incredibly interesting to me, that maybe yeast aren't the only fungi that are contributing to our food experience. So what we find, though, through this global data set is those fungal types tend to vary geographically, whether that's with temperature range, with seasonality, or with pets. Or as Carl mentioned, I bet that altitude is playing a role as well. So I'm really interested to follow up on that, too. We should, we should just keep talking for a long time. <laughs> Um, so we find that the fungi vary geographically. So you can imagine from that map of all of the different samples that we collected from across the globe, if we were to color those by dominant fungal types, we might see blocks of color based on geographic similarity, right? This is those same samples just from the United States colored by bacteria. So you can see the same is not true of bacteria that are found in these sourdough samples. They are not following geographic rules. And in fact, when we tried to figure out what is happening there, we find that bacteria tend to vary with in-house factors. So think about all the things that might be going on uniquely in your own home, regardless of where you live, right, compared to your neighbors. And so this would be things like how many people live in your house, right? This might even be, are you male or female as the baker tending the sourdough starter? Because your microbiome on your body affects the dust in your house, which then becomes an environmental source of microbes that's continuously inoculating your sourdough starter, right? This could be things like, how often do you feed it? Where do you keep this sourdough starter on the counter or in the fridge? All these within-house factors, right? That make that previous graph seem a bit of a mess, but I think it's a beautiful puzzle that different microbial types are kind of following different rules. And most of these bacteria are those key players. They're producing either lactic acid, so those are the bars in gray, or acetic acid. So this is really interesting to me also of what is, you know, kind of the balance of these organic metabolites that are truly affecting the flavor of sourdough. So finding out these bacteria and what they're most likely to produce in this given snapshot, right, of, of this one sample that we got at this one point in time in the sourdough's life. And flour makes a difference too. So these are, these are the first two starters that I made. Um, last June 4th was her birthday, right? And these are starters colonized with local Raleigh microbes. Um, and I have rye on the left and whole wheat on the right. And I, I chose rye versus whole wheat because everything that I'd heard and read anecdotally was that rye flour jump starts your starter. And I am so excited to find out why. <laughs> um, so this has been a perfect place for me to follow up on kind of personal curiosity and hypotheses. But also in the global data set, we find similar trends that the flower types that are fed to these starters really does have an impact on what types of microorganisms are there and the total diversity that resides in each of these starters. So remember, I mean, preaching to the choir again, right? But kind of stepping back from the world of starters, starters are created with flour and water, and flour is ground from grain, right? So, I'm thinking field to ferment. There's an entire story here that I'm really keen to put together, right? What is the, the microbial life and conceptual diagram 
right, that ultimately affects the starters and the breads that you bake with those starters, but that starts in the fields where you grow these grains. So I have a major plug here. Uh, I am looking for partners um, who can help, uh, you know, sources of different grain varieties. Um, and I've spoken with the folks at Lindley. I'm also interested in looking for local mills. Um, so I'm developing kind of slowly in my mind an undergraduate course that I hope to teach at NC State next spring that will actually follow that pathway from grain to flour to sourdough starter. To do that, I need different grains. So there's my plug. If you want to uh, put me in touch with some grains, and for me personally, I just want different varieties of grains, but I know that there are huge efforts ongoing in Rob's lab where we want to look at all sorts of different grains from around the world. So don't be limited. If you're outside of Raleigh, if you are in different countries, I want to talk to you. Um, we want your grains. So we, we would love to partner in a research effort to figure out what are the microbes associated with these plants whose seeds we grind and eat. So, so what's in a grain really? We have these three layers the bran, the endosperm, and the germ, that are also delivering three specific different nutrient profiles, right? But we also have two delivery forms of microbes. So there might be environmental microbes associated with that bran, and there are actually endophytes, so specific beneficial mutualists that are uh, passed from parent plant to the new seed. And those mutualists in the germ tend to be yeasts, at least in grasses. So we have also two distinct different sources of two distinct different types of microbes that we get from these seeds that we like to grind into flour. So for me, from a microbial ecology in this like long timeline story perspective, I'm thinking, okay, so when we make flour, we have not only different nutrient sources coming into these whole grain flours, but we also have different microbial sources, right? Compared to a white flour that, as we discussed yesterday, is going to end up like a large proportion of endosperm. So when you cut down your proportion of bran and germ, you're also cutting down the proportion of other environmental microbes and seed affiliates that could potentially contribute to your sourdoughs. So following up on that more, um, I've been teaching for the last seven years at the North Carolina Governor's School. We get gifted students from all across the state of North Carolina. Last summer was an incredible year for diversity. We had representatives from 46 of the 100 counties in the state. I mean, that's dreamed of and unheard of, but last year we did it. It was awesome. So in their welcome letter, it's like, congratulations, we can't wait to meet you and explore the world of science together. Bring a quarter cup of flour from home. <laughs> And they showed up like, I brought my flour. I'm like, that's awesome, because nobody knows what's in flour. Nobody had cultured the microbes in flour, like extensively before. So this is a citizen science opportunity to really plumb the depths of, again, reconsidering food, thinking about food from a microbial and an ecological and biological perspective, and engaging students in novel data collection. So to do that, from their little Ziploc bag with a quarter cup of flour, they add some flour to water, they shake it, and then when that uh, flour sludge settles down, then they pipette just a few drops into the center of two different Petri plates. And those Petri plates are filled with selective media. YPD is yeast peptone dextrose media. That's the soylent green media, right, for growing yeast. And then to grow bacteria, we use a manragosa agar uh, media that just is a different blend of nutrients that lactic acid bacteria love to grow on. And then we wait four days and we backfill by reading papers by Gobetti um, <laughs> to figure out, you know, why does this matter? What do we know already? What gaps in our knowledge remain? So on day four, the students remember that, you know, they plated, I'm showing you white and whole wheat flour um, as one example, but they brought in almond flour, um, fufu, which is made with green plantains. Um, they brought in all different types of flour. And I brought a number of ancient grains, um, so amaranth, sorghum, millet, teff. Teff is wild 
for just so many different reasons, but also microbially. Um, and what we found is that the white flower tends to have tons of lactic acid bacteria and not a lot of yeast at all, which having looked at the anatomy of a wheat grain and those microbial affili affiliates kind of makes sense to me. You're taking away the germ. You're taking away the bran with environmental sources of microbes. But then when we looked at the whole wheat flour, we find the opposite trends. No lactic acid bacteria in this whole wheat flour whatsoever, which leads me to new questions of, well, where is it coming from then? Is it environmental? Are the LAB typically more starch dependent, right? So this has become, in answering some questions, just a huge source of additional questions. So you can see it's a cascade effect. Citizen science is really fueling continued scientific research, which is incredibly exciting to me. So um, moving forward from that, looking at what microbes are actually culturable from these different flower types, I've also worked with Anne uh, Madden to develop a lesson plan called Sourdough for Science. Um, and I've personally launched this in two different middle schools in Raleigh. So we beta tested at a charter school where you have a little bit more flexibility and adaptation, uh, which was fantastic because they were feeding uh, their starters a cup and a half of, sourdough, of flour every day. And on day three, they're like, everything overflowed. <laughs> and it took 25 minutes to clean up. So what should we do? I said, oh, cut it back, cut it back. You know, so they went back to feeding three quarters of a cup. Um, we wouldn't have had the luxury of that time in a regular public school. So being able to go from different school systems uh, with different programs has been incredible. Um, so we went from Explorus, the charter school, to Moore Square, a magnet middle school, uh, where they're certainly interested but still bounded by time and curriculum standards, right? So having done that successfully now in two schools, we have novel data that is meaningful and I believe publishable so these middle school teachers and their students get to say, I helped do that, which is amazing for you know, the student empowerment. Um, but we also have meaningful data sets of different starters that have been grown from different flower types. So we can continue to measure the growth of a starter, the number of little CO2 bubbles that have been produced in a centimeter square um, every day. And then uh, the pH strips we can use to measure you know, the acidity of these different starters um, and connect these different measurements of microbial metabolism without the luxury of a microbial lab. So I'm calling this countertop science. It's making, uh, it really is democratizing the science and the research. Flour and water are relatively cheap compared to a lot of other things that public school teachers shell out their personal money for. Um, so making that more accessible. Also, um, hearkening back to the food equity um, uh, discussions from yesterday. If students know that they can use flour and water to make a slop that gets fizzy and big that they can put in the oven and bake something that's nutritionally beneficial, hopefully we can start to help um, some of these uh, students feel more secure with their access to food, or at least empowered to pursue options that might be uh, more nutritionally sound. So here's hoping. Um, so this is sourdough for science. And actually, now that, it is, now that it is launched and tested fully, you too can introduce this either in your own home. You can engage anyone else who you, if you're trying to turn them on to sourdough and you know, the joy of learning to like, grow your own microbial garden isn't enough. Um, you can say, and you can contribute to science, right? Um, and what I love too is that it's a cross-generational endeavor. Um, it really is open to anyone who wants to participate. Um, so we do have the curriculum alignment to the North Carolina essential standards for any teachers who want to bring this into the classroom. But truly, anyone can do this anywhere. So we have all the downloads here. We have a slideshow of how to participate, um, materials list about the research, right? I drew a doodle so that people can feel inspired to make their own graphs. Um, we have about the scientists. So you can see, like, these are also what scientists look like as part of another endeavor to showcase diversity. 
Um, and then ultimately, we ask that everyone go to our SciStarter page to actually upload their data. So we have sourdough for science. Once we figure out how you feed it, and we're also asking those students to kind of uh, evaluate how those different sourdough starters smell, right? So connecting how you feed it, how does it smell? The next obvious step is how does it make the bread taste, right? Um, so we have another, another citizen science effort that we put together called New Year, New Bread. Um, wherein we're asking everyone, sourdough project participants, and anyone who completes sourdough for science, or anyone at all, really, um, to follow a standardized recipe for sourdough. And we tried to, it, it's simplified, it's not specialized or specific, so you have to be forgiving, right? It won't make the perfect loaf. But what we're trying here is, given all these different microbial inputs and communities and all these different starters, if you bake a loaf following a standardized recipe, then the crumb, if the crumb is different, if the smell is different, then we can link that more uh, directly back to the microbial differences in your starter. So new year, new bread. We're asking for a picture with a ruler of a slice of bread with a ruler in it so we can measure the size of those air pockets. Um, there's actually software that you can use to um, measure and quantify the crumb, the closeness of the texture of that bread slice, um, so we can actually start to quantify some of these things. So with that, we're really hoping to build um, this complete picture of the starter that's made with flour and has many microbial inputs, both environmental and from these substrates that you're putting in and from yourself as the baker and to truly connect that back to these different products of microbial metabolism that are giving you that experience of eating bread that has been so rewarding nutritionally, but also aesthetically over our human history. So I'm imagining through this concept diagram, eventually, hopefully, I'll be able to put microbes on each of those steps. What's coming from the plant? What's coming from the flower? What's coming from the mill environment? Right? And how does each of those steps and inputs connect to all of these different attributes of bread? And these applications could be designer sourdough starters. So the idea that once we figure out you know, which microbes are best adapted to high altitudes, which microbes are best adapted to more um, equatorial climates, right? can you imagine then instead of having to special order um, specific microbes, if we can link up what feeding practices or what flower types you could use to start your own starter that is already going to select for microbes that are best adapted for your lifestyle or where you live. So that's kind of the pipe dream um, <laughs> where all of this could go. Um, and, and trying to think from an industry perspective more than um, just like the joy of discovery perspective that I typically have in academia. So this idea that, again, democratizing the control, if we can fill in all of those different you know, gaps of knowledge of these microbes and what they're doing for your end products, then what can you do, again, without the benefit of a, a full-blown microbiology lab to cultivate your designer starter? So um, I'll leave uh, this slide up in case you want those links for uh, Sourdough for Science or New Year, New Bread. And thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I've got a couple of quick questions of my own before we turn it over to the audience. Uh, do you prescribe a particular brand or type of flour for everyone's home use? I'm personally very wary of prescribing anything in the baking world, especially in this room. Um, <laughs> I, in terms of uniformity. Um, I think that King Arthur is available on a very widespread basis. So as far as these projects go, at least in the US, and, and I, haven't, I haven't done enough research of like what is available across the world, but King Arthur seems to be uh, a pretty reliable standard flower that's available across the US at least. Um, for these projects, um, for New Year, New Bread, 
we actually standardized the recipe to just use all purpose. Um, again, to try and get away from, even if the same brand isn't available worldwide, like all purpose or strong so, flour. So just, just type rather than brand. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, yeah, well that's important to sponsors and potential sponsors, of course, you know, but also for, for uniformity is what I was thinking mm -hmm. more, more than. Exactly. Especially since you pointed out the differences that different types of flours can. And in my, in my personal adventures with rye, different brands tend to have different coarseness uh, of grind of, of rye and other whole grain flours. So going, you know, a standard white all purpose also kind of gets you to a more uniform. I know there are still differences, but. <laughs> also, uh, um, do you have a timeline in mind for where the research is going to start to give new benchmarks, new results that are uh, measurable? That's also a great question. So. Um, Rob and I were kind of itching to write a paper this spring um, from the sourdough project, and clearly that hasn't happened. But for great reason, um, both Ben and Noah uh, at Tufts University and Colorado University said, you know, we have these great ideas for following up um, with some mechanistic experiments uh, that we'll be performing this summer. So this fall is the new idea. We have a, a sourdough collective retreat already planned for October. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll, we'll be going over those new results and bringing it all into one big story of not only who is living in these starters and what different global aspects might be uh, correlated, but then also what um, those different taxa are capable of doing. So a, a deeper story. Let's open it up. If there's a, we have a few minutes for some questions. I'll start passing the mic around. and. Uh, Fascinating, uh, fascinating, Aaron, and thanks very much. Um, as a layman and I watch, uh, and, uh, watching, I'm, I'm asking myself, what are the implications for naturally, uh, uh, naturally ground flours, whole grain flours versus refined flours? Because it would seem to me what you're selling us is we have a wonderful reservoir of natural bacteria, adapted bacteria in the whole grains uh, that we're throwing away when we refine flowers? I love that question. Um, so from my perspective, from a gut microbial perspective, whole grain is, is typically going to be more preferable, right? Thinking about more diverse substrates and also having uh, secondary plant compounds and a lot more fiber and complex carbohydrates for those diversity of microorganisms to chew on in your lower gut. From a sourdough perspective, Part of the sourdough for science um, kind of initiative is to get at some of those differences, um, to, to get an idea of when we use different whole grains, and also in this undergrad class that I'm developing, right? So my second plug for uh, varieties of whole grains, um, figuring out what are the associates, uh, the microbial uh, types that are associated with different whole grains, and then to what extent are they successful in colonizing a sourdough? Yeah, I'm really interested in looking into that. Um, we don't know a lot about it at all, except to think that you know there are endophytes that live inside those seeds, yeah, right. there, and there are environmental microbes on the outsides of those seeds. So this, uh, there's a crop mutualist project through Rob Dunn's lab that's looking at the endophytes in seed banks, because we save seeds all over the world, what microbes are we also saving, and how, or you know, in what ways, might those microbes be affecting the viability of those seeds? But also, if you then use any of those seeds or any seed at all to create a flower that you're feeding to a starter, yeah, how do different plant types, seeds, affect the ultimate microbial output? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So it's conceivable in two years when we reconvene that we may have some, some data. Working into the future, and we're right on the, only the, the beginning edge of exactly, this. exactly. This is just the leading edge. That's so. great news. Tom. Yeah, so I was kind of curious, what's your guys' plan to be able to put this into the, the public discourse as far as your, your findings and making it accessible to, so that 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 we can take that science and actually turn it into the real world. And then the second part of that is, are you guys still doing all of the data processing in house, or have you started to democratize that a little bit as well? And starting to, to take that citizen science to the next step of 
where in the future having us, the citizens, help you interpret all that data opposed to trying to do it all on, on your fixed resources? Excellent questions. So for the first, um, returning the results to the data, that's a really important part of our mission and Rob Dunn's lab um, as kind of directors of these citizen science projects, not just like thank you for the samples and all of this data, but like here's what we're actually finding, right? So on the, on the um, Sourdough Project webpage, we do post in a blog post kind of style uh, updates of what we're learning. So the maps that we, um, the map that I showed you of all the samples, that's actually an interactive map online that if you, you can search for your sample by your participant number, if you are a participant, for any participants in the room, you can search by your participant number and then by you know, others' numbers. And if you hover over that sample dot, then it shows you the top 10 most abundant yeast and bacteria. And for the yeast and bacteria that we know anything about currently, then it also shows a little profile of these are heterofermentative, you know? Um, so trying to hand back some of that knowledge about you know, what we found in those starters. Um, as far as data analysis and visualization, as an educator, to me, that's the next obvious step in empowering the public and students especially by giving them valuable life skills uh, beyond the classroom. I am working on it. Um, there, the trouble there is um, mostly the interfaces, right? So, these data sets, if you have, oh, 20 to 40 million DNA sequences from 563 starters, right? Um, that data set in itself is a lot to analyze. So I think at least for now, until we go to like democratized cloud analysis or something like that, at least for now, the idea is to keep the first few steps of the pipeline in-house but then when we have the table of all the samples, all the microbes, and how abundant they are in each type uh, of starter, to be able to put that table, which is still humongous, but somewhat more wieldy, um, to put that online for the general public to start to dive into. Because then there could be um, kind of crowdsourced hypothesis development and, and finding of, um, of different trends that then we could also, you know, Say, oh, that looks really interesting, but here's why you know we might want to go in this direction instead, um, and kind of do a, a check for for quality and statistical power. One final question before we end, and we'll keep this one out of the hall. How about that? So I have a kind of weird question. Um, I love those. <laughs> <laughs> Would your research kind of help with like the? I guess if you're allergic to flour, like it, like the bacteria, if that you're researching inside of it will help you find what makes people allergic. Because uh, recently I was, uh, my my skin started eating at my flesh uh, and I work with flour every day and uh, I pinched my finger with metal tongs and the, it, the doctor said that it could have been because there was iron in the flour and like different bacterias and he wasn't quite sure what it was but now I have this problem where I just, my skin starts to get red and it gets eaten at when I touch flour. It's only certain flour, though. So I was wondering if this research kind of like connects a little bit. I wasn't sure. Um, yeah, that's that's huge, and that also touches on some side projects that I've done uh, dealing with the inflammatory system, uh, the immune system, and how how much chronic systemic inflammation there is, just in you know our modern lifestyles. Um, I'm very keen to. Um, talk with you informally, I, but we don't know. Um, I don't know enough to say, um, yeah, I, I will speculate with you at length. Um, but yeah, because I have a lot of ideas, but I think we'll yeah. definitely go over time. Well, the implications of all of this are obvious, you know, that they, it can go in so many directions and, and open up a whole new discourse. I'll close with one final question. Uh, and maybe some of you have thought this as well. Uh, any possibility of the work that you're doing and the work that uh, Carl has been talking about, sharing some of that data and being able to fertilize each other's work? Oh my gosh, I'm there. <laughs> I'm there. How about you guys? <laughs> yeah, all right. I'm there. <laughs> all right, so we're bringing it all together. All right, so here's what I suggest. I know there's more questions. Uh, we need to uh, take a break. We're gonna reconvene here at 11.30, but uh, please uh, interact and, and talk 
you know, with Aaron and, and keep the conversation going. Uh, we, you, and again, beyond this symposium, be able to communicate with each other as well. All of your contact info should be in the, in the Whova app so you can track each other down, but if you need to, make sure you get emails and things like that. And, uh, oh, and uh, Aaron, on behalf of J.A. Henkels, thank you very much. Thank you. For, for <laughs> This great presentation. We're going to continue. Thank you. Thank all of you. We're going to continue after the break. We're going to. We, we, you started to touch on a little bit of the technological implications, technology, uh, even in terms of uh, licensing and patenting, and some of these discoveries. Uh, we'll continue and open up the, the conversation into the gluten-free sector at 11:30 uh, with Alexandra uh, Zeitz, and come on back at 11:30 for another round. Then we'll have lunch. Okay, thanks, take a break. See you at 11.30 back here. <laughs>